Good morning. You have been in suspension for nine, 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 nine. Yo, I'm Zach. Welcome to my shop. Today, we're making a blank portal core with the blessing of its 3D modeler, Serb. Thank you, Serb. We have a lot of work to do. Let's get started. First, we need to set up the 3D models in Cura so that they print in the correct orientation. Let's see here, this is too small. How about 150%? 200%? There we go, 300% should do it. I'm going to need some filament for this. I tried to be Mr. Smart Guy and print in this orientation. Don't. Spend the extra time in filament and make sure that it gets done right the first time. Pull supports and raft for the big and really small stuff. Just supports for the rest. We're not leaving anything to chance. Now that everything's printed and ready to go, let's pack everything up and set it out in the garage. The supports were removed and all of the pieces got a preliminary sanding to help clean up the prints and flatten the lines. The extreme cases even got some use of my rotary tool. We're finally ready for our first of many coats of primer. There's a lot to correct here, so I'm starting with the heavy duty stuff. Filler primer. A few coats of that should save us a little time applying and sanding. Each piece got an even coat of primer. When dried, the primer was sanded down until the print lines could be seen. This allowed me to see where the spot putty was needed to fill in some of the deeper holes. The process of sanding and applying primer went on for many days and nights until I liked what I saw. This part takes so much time. Look, you can even see the sun shadow moving across the table here, and I have gigabytes of video just like that. But I'll cut to the chase. Hey, look, the sanding is done. That was easy. Here's an application or two of white base coat primer so that we can move on to painting. A game-changing strategy for painting is propping up your pieces so that paint can evenly reach all the areas it needs to. For today's parts, I'll be using kebab sticks, hot glue, and good sturdy wood bases pulled out of my scrap bin. I'll show you the process. Drill kebab-sized holes into your base piece in a pattern that will best support the part. Dab a couple globs of hot glue to the top of the sticks. After you glue your part to the top of the stick, presto! You're ready for business. All of the pieces got one more wipe off and cleaning. After the first coat of paint, there's no going back, so let's do this. I'm using two different flavors of paint here. Flat black with a matte finish for the front arms and several of the internal components. Then we have this gloss white, which is actually the same white that I used on my portal turret build. For the first coat of paint, I did the tried and true light coat for all of the parts. After the light coat fully dried, I followed it up with two heavy coats with a 24-hour dry in between each coat. Here's an idea of what the pieces looked like after the final coat. We'll let that dry for a couple days while we work on my favorite part, the internal electronics. Here's the heart of the project, a remote control color-changing LED light strip. When I picked up a handful of these boxes, they were cheap. Five bucks. We have all the colors we need to do this preloaded into the LED controller board. With a little finesse, I think we can salvage everything that we need for the eye in just one of these boxes. At 300% size, we can safely fit six of these LEDs vertically in the eye. So each of the LEDs were cut along the predetermined lines marked on the strip. In order to solder to each of the LED assemblies, the clear rubber was slowly and carefully peeled off the top. In order for the most even distribution of light possible, tinfoil, with the shiny side outwards was glued flat inside the eye housing using a small pick. The rotary tool was used at this time to take out the internal support structure to make room for all of the frontal layers we'll be putting in later. The tin foil was polished with a metal polish I had on hand to give it its maximum shine. Now we can move on back to the lights. Each of the eight pads on all of the LEDs were tinned, preparing them for wire. To prevent a massive short circuit against the tin foil, capped on tape was cut in strips just big enough to cover each end of the LEDs. The adhesive side of the lights were uncovered, capped on tape applied to each end, and finally each LED was stuck on the inside of the eye housing evenly. 
Soldering the LEDs back together is actually quite simple despite what it looks like. We just need to restore the connections that were cut. I used color-coded wire so that it would be easy to reference. Black wire will be the 5 volts red to red, blue to blue, green to green. Imagine the hole in the middle is where you start, and then keep going until all of the LEDs are soldered together. Make sure there's enough wire coming out of the back of the eye, and make sure that the wire doesn't cover the light itself. Here's what it should look like after it's done. After repainting this part right here black, I started planning on how I was going to finish building the eye. The eye patterns will be designed in Photoshop to be laser cut, then the center light distribution layer will be traced and cut out on the scroll saw. Let's measure the diameter of the hole and get started. For that I used scraps from a broken TV I had in storage, but I'm sure that enough layers of that thin cutting board would have worked perfectly too. There we go. Perfect fit. These little cracks are easily filled with super glue and baking soda, scraped down to shape. The eye pattern will be laser cut onto this cheap thin dollar store cutting board covered with black vinyl, and I have tons of this stuff left over, so let me know if there's any other core eyes you want to see get made. Here's a lot of laser cutting done in a short amount of time. Mm, beautiful. After using the pick on the eye covers and some cutting done with the scissors, we already have a lot of cores to pick from. And I do have to note that it's important to leave a small tab on the eye cover to be able to change them out. Let's head back down to the workbench. The pieces were removed off the painting platforms for assembly. We'll be working on the actuators next. The inside of the actuators... Oh jeez. Help me out, Google. Axe were inserted into the holes of the Support Verrail. I should have paid better attention in French class. No worries, I'll provide the thumbnail of the picture of what I'm referencing in my crudest English interpretation of the part somewhere on the screen. With a little help from the heat gun, the balls pop right into the sockets. The outside of the actuators were wrapped with yellow vinyl and given the same treatment popping into the sockets of this piece. Support Vérinqueur. After a little silver paint was applied around the vinyl, the Carter-oeil. The eye housing we worked on earlier was fitted into this. Support Vérinqueur. All the excess wire from the eye was run through this hole so that the actuators could be fitted together as such. The pivoting point between the two pieces was going to be an issue no matter what I did. Maybe if I used a stronger filament or printed in a different orientation, I could have safely snapped the two pieces together without issue. However, I heated one side of the pivot to attach the two sides together, then bent the side back to its original shape locking the two pieces together. We'll make a cover for the sides later to make it look sharp and clean. After painting the inner bezel in hinge silver, we can finally get back to working on the electronics. Here's the most inexpensive power bank I could find at Harbor Freight that doesn't turn off automatically when not drawing enough voltage. On the inside, there's a 18650 3.7 volt 7.4 watt hour battery with a little controller board pressure fit on the side. There's one input, one output, two LED indicator lights, all of which I believe will be perfect for us. Let's mount the LED controller board. I desoldered the controller board off the beginning of the original LED strip and the USB power input that we previously cut off of. A hole was drilled just big enough to run the 5 volt, red, blue, and green wires. The color wires were soldered where the appropriate pins were. Then the 5 volt input wires were soldered back where the USB plug was. After the board was mounted with sticky tape, the 5 volt input wires were run back through another smaller hole. Now we just have the battery controller board and the battery to work on. Wires were soldered directly to the battery, then the board was cleaned up by removing the battery contact mounts. As long as we have all these great connections on the board, we might as well use them, right? I carefully used my rotary tool and microfile on the back cover to make a precise hole just big enough to fit the input-output side of the battery controller board. The battery was soldered where the battery contacts were, then the 5 volt and negative output wires were soldered on the inside pins of the USB output. After a quick test, the battery was hot glued out of the way, and all the wires were cleaned up with twist ties and shrink tubing. We're going to need to see what the LEDs on the battery controller board are doing that will help us diagnose issues in the future. That is, if we have any. A small indicator hole was drilled in front of the board. I want to be able to completely disassemble the core for upgrades in the future, so instead of gluing everything together, we'll be drilling and tapping holes just big enough to screw in these 
number eight 32 by a half hex cap screws. Two of these screw holes were drilled into the bottom assembly to firmly hold everything together. That indicator hole that we made was then filled in with a little hot glue and flattened with a razor. After cleaning up some of the lines with black paint, we can move on. I really wanted to make you guys proud, so I spent several days polishing, then waxing the outer shell pieces. This will help me protect the paint as I assemble everything together and finish up the details. I think it turned out alright. What do you think? Let's do some detail painting. We'll add a little black down these strips right here on both sides of the outer shell. Now we'll add a little black in the holes and lines of the eye cover. A little light blue was applied in several layers down the outer edges of the outer shell. The vinyl cutting machine was used to cut out the little tiny aperture logos for the front faceplates and the actuators. Don't forget the white logo on the side. Let's take a second to appreciate all the detail work that we've done. I finished printing the little pieces to finish the build around this time, then carefully painted all the bezel ring silver with a brush after stripping the wax from the areas. These pieces listed below were glued up on sticks, then given a couple coats of metallic silver paint in the garage. Now if you're wondering why some pieces look a little less finished than others, I actually have high hopes to make molds of them in the future and replace them with metal or solid resin. On that note, I also have plans to make a vacuformer to make windows for the sides. Stay tuned for another possible video. Until then, the sides were scuffed up with the rotary tool to give the 5 minute epoxy something to grab onto. These pieces were glued to these. Then both assemblies were glued rubber banded to the sides of the body. The front faceplate for the eye is designed to be glued to the front on these guide sticks. I think I figured out a way to get around that so that we can still disassemble and upgrade. The holes in the bottom of the front faceplate were widened with a drill to fit the hex screw tops. The guide sticks were flattened with a flush cutters and rotary tool. Then rare earth magnets were fitted to sit flush in between the faceplate and the print. Holes were drilled where the guide sticks were, then filled with 5 minute epoxy to give the screws something to thread into. After the holes were drilled into the epoxy, then threaded, everything fits perfectly. These magnets snap so hard together, I will never have to worry about this coming loose. Silver detail paint was added to the front arms, and black was added to the and the top of the rare earth magnets. Light blue to the tips of the X and the Y rails, and as promised, silver faceplate covers were made for the center hinge. Final stretch. A hole was drilled and tapped big enough through the rear of the assembly to fit a single 5 16 18 by 1 and a half hex cap screw. The belt, or the slides into place, right here. Both the X and the Y rails were lubricated with WD-40. Alright kids, put your French hats back on. Rail underscore X dot STL was screwed into the holes that we made into the following the guides. Both eyelids, or the were secured to the rail underscore Y dot STL by using the pressed glued into then rail underscore Y dot STL was screwed into place using the 5 16 hex cap screw on the rear of the assembly guiding the eyelids into place over the top of the eye cover faceplate snaps into place now over the top of the eyelids and I added a little felt in between the rail and the eyelid to add pressure and protection. I'm impressed how well the assembly fits into the outer shell. It's honestly really well designed. The assembly just drops into the shell after you line everything up. The two outer shell pieces then just snap together. Four more holes were drilled and tapped where the arms go for the same amount of number eight hex cap screws. After the arms are screwed in, I, I think we're done. You have to check out all the features. I can easily change the color with the remote control. 
The center eye pivots around and the eyelids slide up and down. The arms are easily positioned. You can see a solid blue light through the indicator hole for active power, blinking red for charging, and solid red for charge complete. Yes, you can still use the core to charge your phone. I needed some items to show off how big this thing is, so here's a can of soda, a full can of spray paint, and a full-size CD. Oh yeah, here's my turret I built. If you haven't seen that video, here's the link on the screen somewhere. And of course, yes, it does have a real laser on it. I have a whole list of upgrades that I would like to do on this someday in the video description. What upgrades would you like to give the core? Let me know in the comments down below. I have no definitive plans for my next video, so let me know what you would like to see. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.